Hello everyone, and welcome once again to the frozen icy crags of the never-ending comic book vault. I'm Captain Logan. Today we're continuing our series on Batman No Man's Land. We're into Volume 3 now, and this book chronicles mostly the uh, beginnings of Cassandra Kane, who is uh, one of my favorite Batman characters now. Unfortunately, um, she's not set up real well in this. I mean, I, I feel like she should have appeared in some places earlier in the series, She's kind of dropped into this real quick. We get all the backstory about her father, Kane, and how he trained Batman, and all this stuff all at once, and then, bam, she's Batgirl. And, uh... Once again, as I've been talking about a little bit uh, throughout this series, um, Greg Rucka's novel, um, Greg Rucka's novelization of No Man's Land handles it a whole lot better. Uh, she, if I'm remembering it right, it's set up a little bit earlier. Uh, we get to get into her, her head a lot more, of course, and it's just it's spread out a little bit more. Um, one of the things I like about the novel, as opposed to the comics, is that um, the framework of it, it, the framework of a lot of it, is the uh, diary of Barbara Gordon, and uh, actually, it's it's not even a diary so much as a letter that she's writing to her father, uh, chronicling everything that's going on in No Man's Land. And, and here, um, that's hinted at uh, toward the beginning, where we see her writing it. But we find out in the novel that she's that it's actually a letter to her father, uh, where she's finally coming out and telling him that that she is that she was in fact Batgirl and that she's Oracle, and um, and then uh, well you know what I don't even want to spoil the ending of the novel, um, but because uh, I because I do want everybody to read it uh, anyway. Once again, let me mention of course uh, as I'm jumping around here, um, as always with the series that uh, I'm spoiling things. I'm uh, kind of just explaining stuff that happens in this while also giving my opinions on it uh, for those of you that haven't had a chance to read it and for whom maybe it's been a little while. Um, so, uh, so Cassandra Kane. basically what happens is uh, it's, it's revealed um, pretty much as soon as Cassandra Kane is revealed uh, that the Huntress is, of course, the new Batgirl. And um, I kind of, uh, I, I didn't want to come out and say it last time, even though I knew that, that, was, that, that that's what it was, uh, just because I hadn't gotten to this part yet, but I, I tried to hint at it a little bit um, at the end of that video where, uh, where I mentioned, oh, and where's Huntress? Um, I don't feel like the series does the best job of making this into a really interesting mystery, mostly because because who else could it possibly be? Um, Huntress is a major character in the first in the first trade. Um, she's got a character arc. We're, we're following her uh, in No Man's Land, um, like everybody else, trying to. Um, decide how she's going to operate and function, and uh, seeing her, um, seeing her, her uh, you know, question her convictions like everybody else is. And like I said in that first video, she kind of goes in a different direction than everybody else. Uh, I, other, other characters, especially Gordon, who we'll get to in a minute, um, other characters get get really hardened, and they uh, they they seem to uh, start losing the morality a little bit. Not so much losing it, but having to go against it. And uh, the Huntress takes a step back and starts thinking about doing things more Batman's way. And that's really the reason she puts on the bat suit. Um, at first, it seems like it's because Batman's not around, and people need that hopeful symbol. And I like this this arc with the Huntress, where where she seems to secretly really really believe in the idea of Batman. But what she doesn't like about Batman is that he's too controlling and he's too limited because he refuses to go as far as as he could to get the job done. And of course, you know, she's willing to kill when necessary and Batman's not, and that's the big thing that separates them. So she puts on the Batgirl costume she she makes this she apparently she's a great uh, designer of costumes because she makes this fantastic bat, bat girl costume and I really like how it it uh, it has a, a full mask um, it, it, it's only it looks almost as if she made a regular mask and then at the last minute decided to sew a bottom on it just in case uh, Batman knew her face too well and had a good sense of what her jawline looked like so she's like oops can't have that um, and then when Cassandra Kane takes it over she just keeps using that so um, what, what I don't like is that she's being Huntress and Batgirl all the way through the first trade. Seem, as far as I can tell, just 
as a writing thing so that we won't suspect that she's Batgirl. And they kind of have to do that because, like I said, who else could it possibly be? Uh, there, there are no other major female protagonists that have the kind of skills that it would take to do the things she's doing, and um, especially, you know, to fight off entire uh, entire waves of, of gangsters and things. So, um, what... Well, gangsters, of, 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 of people in gangs. So, what I... What I don't like is that when you get in the second trade, she's not there at all, uh, Huntress. And y you see her as Batgirl the entire way through. And it gets a little bit suspicious because it's like, where is this character that was a major player uh, toward the beginning, but, but now suddenly isn't? And I think part of that is just a problem with the format. Because if you were reading these in issues, maybe it wouldn't occur to you as hard, but like... It, it, the trades seem almost set up like this is the trade where Huntress and where we see Huntress and Batgirl. This is the trade where we just see Batgirl, and then here, uh, Volume Three, this is the trade where uh, where uh, it's revealed that she is Batgirl. Um, I don't understand why she's operating as both earlier. I, I really don't. I uh, I mean, is, does she is she afraid that um, that like Batman's gonna be wondering where the Huntress is and then put two and two together? Uh, maybe that's what it is. We're not told. I don't feel like we get in her head enough to, to, to figure out really her motivations for doing that. Now, her motivations for being Batgirl are, are very clear. Um, she wants to um, she wants to impress Batman. And like I said, she seems to uh, really appreciate the, the notion of Batman, and uh, she just doesn't like that, that Batman's so controlling. Uh, but but she but she tries so hard. And like I said uh, last time, I think it's really sad at the end of that second volume um, the uh, position Batman puts her in, and here he blames her for it. And um, and you know, Two Face takes over a bunch of his territory, and she says, "What did you expect me to do?" She she's only one person. She and uh, there was no way she could possibly hold all those forces off on her own. And she says, what did you expect me to do? And Batman says, more. Um, I'm a little confused about Batman. Um, and again, it makes a lot more sense in, in the novelization. We need to get in Batman's head a lot more than we do here to understand his motivations for being so obsessed with doing everything on his own. And it, it really comes off like He's just doing that because he's Batman, and that's how he prefers to operate. And he says here that, that he thought that with No Man's Land he needed to, to take a back-to-basics approach, where he didn't work with anyone, he worked completely on his own. But my question is, why? Is it because he is afraid of people getting hurt? Is it... I mean, I mean, like, 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 what, what, what exactly, what exactly is it? Because it seems as though something changed between Cataclysm and No Man's Land that got him to this point. Because after all, he was working with people before that. He had allies before the Cataclysm. So why is his uh, mode of operations just suddenly changing? I mean, I mean, uh, part of his character arc in this has been realizing that in the No Man's Land he can't operate like he used to. So I don't understand why he's why he's regressing back to his early earliest days, like your one days, like pre any Robins. Um, I, I just, I just simply don't understand it. Um, he, he's, he, he is refusing to work with anybody. Um, then, then this Batgirl shows up, who he knows from the beginning is Huntress, of course, and um, you know, because he's Batman. <laughs> um, but honestly, that's okay because, frankly, I called it too when I first read it. It's like, who else could it be? Um, like I said, but anyway, um, what's um, What's strange is that Batman, uh, just all of a sudden it clicks for him. He goes, he, you know, after, uh, after the Two-Face thing, um, you know, after Two-Face takes over a bunch of his territory, he goes, okay, I need allies. It's like suddenly something clicks in, in his head, he, and, he, and he just suddenly gets it. I don't understand why it took that. Uh, it's, it's a no-man's land. You're trying to hold down territories. Um, it's, it's different than just parole, you know, patrolling the streets. And, and, and yes, I realize that he kind of has allies in, like, lockup and people like that who are, like, helping him with his jail, but he needs an army like anybody else, and so he finally figures that out. And here uh, he 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 calls in um, he calls in Tim, Tim Drake, and he calls in Dick Grayson, and he's got so so Nightwing and Robin. He's got Asriel, um, and uh, he. 
and then he ends up using Cassandra Cain. And he's very quick to put Cassandra Cain in the Batsuit. Uh, he, he, he insists that he can trust her. And some of the others are like, well, how can you be absolutely positive? And it's revealed, which I think is really interesting, uh, that her father, Kane, who uh, was a, um, who's, who's a professional killer, um, who, who, uh, who brought his daughter up uh, in the ways of violence, and, uh, and the only language she knew is violence, so she doesn't speak in this. Um, that is, she's learning from Barbara Gordon, but that, you know, her, her, uh, her being fluent in English comes later. She, all she knows is the language of violence, which I think is fascinating. And once again, um, covered a lot more in depth in the novel. Um, but anyway, uh, he's really quick to put her in the suit because it turns out that Kane was one of the people who trained him. And I think all that, um, is really interesting. But I, I still, um... It still bugs me a little bit the way he treats Huntress. I, I just I don't I don't like his spirit to her. You know she tries so extremely hard, and then uh, and and then she says, "Look, I can't do things your way." The thing is though, she's been trying to do things his way, and what she's really angry about doesn't seem to even be so much. I mean, she says this, but it doesn't even seem to be so much that he's giving her orders and telling her what what she has to do. So much as berating her for things that she couldn't possibly control. And he, she even says, and I don't understand the distinction, um, she, she even says, you're, um, you're, why are, you, you know, so, so you're blaming me for this? And he says, no, I'm holding you responsible. And he says, I'm also holding myself responsible. And, and I, I guess, I, I guess I get that Kind of, I don't know. It's just I, I feel like he's berating her almost to the point of absurdity. Um, he's gotta, he's gotta know that no person could physically do the things that he that he's asking them to. And then, and then he, he kind of, he kind of has this attitude, well, of well, if you can't be as good as me, then you're not, then you're not worthy of the mantle. But nobody is as good at, as Batman. I mean, that's kind of the point of Batman, right? Um, you know, he doesn't seem to expect the same sorts of things from Robin and Nightwing, really. Um, so, I don't know. I, I think it's kind of unfair. Now, to, to, to be fair, he doesn't tell Huntress she can't keep being Batgirl. He just tells her she has to do what he says. But she quits because she can't stand the way that he's talking to her. And frankly, I found I couldn't really, I couldn't really blame her. Um, once again, I'm, I'm not sure that it doesn't make sense so much as we're not told enough. I feel like we need to get a little bit more in his head and we need to have a little bit more of an internal monologue from Batman so that we have a better understanding as to um, A, why he's refusing, well not even not even multi-parts, just simply why is he refusing before the Two-Face thing to to, uh, to work with people. Let's get into Commissioner Gordon for a minute because I didn't talk about him enough last time and there were a couple of major things set up in Volume 2 that I didn't bring up about Gordon. Um, the, 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 the big thing is that he has made a deal with, uh, with the devil. He's made a deal with Two-Face. And uh, we see the scene where that happens, but we don't know it's Two-Face. We can kind of guess, though. And uh, then here it's revealed, of course, that he made a deal with Two-Face, and that part of the, the reason that uh, Two-Face was able to take over so much of Batman's territories is because Two-Face made a deal with him. Well, of course, uh, Gordon tries to get um, out of that deal. Uh, Two-Face, toward the end of this, um, kidnapped Rene Montoya, who um, previously he had actually worked with to save a bunch of people in the Cataclysm in a story that, uh, that, that was in Volume 2, which I thought was really, really interesting. And he kind of snaps, snaps back to um, normal after a while, and uh, now that he's got this relationship with Montoya, he's, uh, he's, he's using her as leverage so that Gordon will uh, keep his truce with him and keep doing things for him. So... Anyway, um, Gordon, like I said last time, is kind of lost it, and what he's what uh, what he's mostly angry about is that um, is that Batman left, or at least that's what it seems like. But see, there's a there's a little mention, maybe it's not so little, in, in Volume Two that I didn't, that I didn't bring up last time, where we discover that. Jim Gordon actually tried to get another job as a commissioner outside of the outside of Gotham uh, just before they uh, closed off the bridges. And everyone laughed him out of every precinct everywhere because he relied on a vigilante, or because it seemed like he relied on a vigilante. Uh, there again, uh, there's another one of those those bits where um, it's it's almost it's it's kind of difficult to swallow that Batman could remain an urban legend and nobody's really sure if he exists when people also are sure enough that they're laughing Gordon out of precincts. But anyway. Um, it seemed, I, I honestly think that that's got to be more what he's angry about, is that he's questioning his entire history with Batman. What I don't like is that this is played up kind of like 
what he's really on about is just that Batman left for a while and then came back because he's not he he refuses to talk to Batman. And then here, Batman finally comes to him, and we finally get a confrontation, and Gordon won't even let him explain anything. And I just, I just don't like that. I, I feel like it's, it's a little bit out of character, and I, and I think that it's, it's trying really hard to make it in character because he's so angry with Batman, but once again, we don't get it in his head enough. What exactly are, is it, what, what's, the motiv what's the motivation? Is it that he is angry that Batman left for a while, or is it that he's um, that he's questioning having ever worked with Batman because he became so dependent on him, and now they're in this horrible catastrophe, and because he was uh, laughed out of all these precincts, and and the only place he had to go was Gotham, and he went back there, and he's got to live in this horrible, horrible hellhole. Um, it, perhaps he's decided that uh, that um, he's got to prove to himself more than anybody that he doesn't need a vigilante to do his work for him. And all I'm saying that, that I don't like is that it's played up so much that, especially here um, in in this volume, that the reason he's so um, uh, he's so angry is is because is because Batman left him, and it just seems like. If you would just give him a second to explain that, um, I mean, it would be difficult because he would have to tell him he's Bruce Wayne. See, that's the other thing too is that you've you've got we haven't gotten to this to this yet, but I will say that you do have a Jim Gordon here who, um, in stories around this, you get the sense that maybe he already he kind of has a sense of who Bruce Wayne is, so that could play into it also uh, because maybe he actually knows of the reason that he left. But um, but I mean, you, you know, Batman. Batman didn't leave because he was scared, you know? Um, Batman didn't leave because he was angry with himself for not being able to stop an earthquake. It wasn't anything like that. Uh, he left because he wanted to try to get the government to save the No Man's Land as Bruce Wayne. Um, and the other thing he he wanted to do was uh, just prepare um, for for the no man's land. And of course, he came back in and realized there was nothing you could do to prepare for this. Um, the, it, it, it's a place unlike anything he's ever seen, and he doesn't know what to do with it until he learns the lay of the land again. His biggest mistake seems to have been leaving, except that that's all in hindsight. How would he have known? I mean, I think that. It, it just my personal opinion, I think he was probably right to, you know, go as Bruce Wayne and attempt to do the best that he that he could to fix things. Once again, we've got some more uh, shorter uh, stories going on here. Um, oh, I should also mention that uh, one thing I really do like is that uh, when Huntress goes off. Um, and gets angry uh, at Batman and decides not to be Batgirl anymore. Um, she goes and um, and uh, al allies herself with Pettit, uh, who is the um, the uh, kind of shoot from the hip cop that we uh, were talking about in the first volume. And uh, they seem to have a similar idea about how things should be done. And since she feels like she couldn't do things Batman's way, she's going to go back more toward the way she used to do things. And she found this this uh, this cop that's ready to shoot first and ask questions later. So I really like that and, and how that's all being set up. Um, there's a story about, um, and, I, and I, actually this is the best part in this, I think, uh, there, there, there's a story about uh, Poison Ivy. We finally get to Poison Ivy because we've known that she's in the um, the gardens in the middle of the city. And uh, we, we discover that she is, of course, where the produce has been coming from. Uh, we, we've been wondering why there's been some fresh fruit here and there. And it turns out that um, that that uh, Penguin has been getting it from her through Clayface because Clayface has um, has basically kidnapped her and uh, used his clay to um, to uh, you know stick her into the ground and then feeds her salt all the time and and, and it just totally weakens her and so uh, all she can do is just pretty much whatever he says. Um, she's also got these kids that are working for her, which is really interesting. Uh, before Clayface got to her, she was um, she was taking care of these kids who got left behind when No Man's Land got got a got a well, when No Man's Land happened, uh, and they lost their parents, and they ended up going to Poison Ivy, and um, and uh, they help her, and she gives them food, and it, it it's it's really interesting. Uh, it gives us kind of a different side to Poison Ivy. Um, she she uh, she's got kind of a she's got kind of a mother thing going on here. It's re it's uh it's really it's really interesting, and I like that she's not just another villain throwing stuff at Batman in this. And uh, so basically, um, Batman figures this out, and um, 
and ends up stopping Clayface and makes a deal with her to um, make produce for the city that Batman will then distribute around to people. So he's making things a, a, a better place. Uh, the, the trade opens with a story about Superman who comes in and uh, decides to try to uh, to try to help. I'm not entirely sure as to why he waited as long as he did, but uh, but anyway, he comes in and um, he says, I'm going to bring power back to Gotham. And he finds a man who used to work at the power plant. And he uh, and there's this really touching moment, too, where, where, uh, where he gives this, this man a, a chief engineer hat, and uh, the man's all proud because uh, now he's the chief engineer and he has, um, he has his job back and he he's, has worth again. And I, I, I thought that was really touching touching moment. And um, Superman, being Superman, uh, thinks that he can kind of solve everybody's problems pretty quickly and uh, realizes that they're not, that, that a lot of them are not ready to go back to civilization yet. Um, I'm of two minds about this, because basically the, the, the idea is that uh, he helps this guy get the uh, get power back up in, in, in parts of the city, and then um, and then all these people, you know, they, they have some of them ha have power again, uh, but they come to him in the power plant um, wanting heat and warmth and insisting on giving him tribute, because that's how things work now in Gotham, and Superman is trying to explain, no, he doesn't have to work that way, but they don't get it. Now, I'm of two minds about this. On the one hand... Um, humans are adaptable creatures, and I, 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 but also set in their ways. And so I can, I can kind of see the idea that that uh, you know, you know, four to six months in no man's land would feel like an eternity, and you you might start to kind of um, lose your notions about civilization and about society and what things were like, you know, you know, before. And if you can't see an end to it, um, you you might get um, you might get trapped in the new culture which seems to be what they're doing. What I don't understand is that Superman kind of just buys what Batman's selling, helps out for a few hours, and then flies off. Because Batman um, says, you know, help for 24 hours and then come see me. And he seems to know that Superman's going to figure out that these people aren't ready for his help, and then he's just going to fly off, which is precisely what happens. My question is... What does Superman think is going to happen that's going to make these people any more ready for his kind of help without paying tribute and and uh, and you know getting things closer to what they remember as civilization? What does he think is going to happen in the no man's land that's going to get them closer to that? Um, I don't know why he couldn't help in other ways. I, I like you know maybe he is afraid of being looked at as a god or something, but I don't understand why he can't at least fly some food over things things like that because obviously no one's trying to stop him uh, flying into the no man's land. Um, so. I mean, I, I understand the idea of the story, but I'm not sure I buy that, in, that it's in Superman's character to show up in No Man's Land, help out for a little while, realize that um, these people aren't, aren't ready, and then just leave and not come back. Um, I mean, it's... It just doesn't make a whole ton of sense to me. Um, then there's a story uh, just after that with uh, Mr. Freeze that is just ridiculous, um, and 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 I really don't like it um, because what, what it and, and luckily it's not very long. Um, it, it's it's uh, Mr. Freeze uh, trying to get uh, possession of a power plant, and um, there's there's a lot of there's a lot of electrical power stuff going on at the beginning of this. And uh, Batman's trying to stop him. And what's the story itself is okay. What's annoying about it is just all of the banter between them. Because there's a lot of ice puns. I mean, it's not Batman and Robin bad, but there's ice puns. And then they keep trying to one-up each other intellectually with li with literary references constantly. And like at the end of this, they're, they're, they're talking about the modern Prometheus with Frankenstein and just all, all these things. And it just doesn't fit in this story. Uh, it feels like if... And, and I'm not sure who wrote that one. Um, I, I'll have to check real quick. But it it, it feels it feels like if um, like 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 a if like like late '70s Batman writing intruding upon No Man's Land. Um, it's uh, Larry Hama who who I don't know. Um, but anyway, I, I don't know. I feel like I'm, I'm being a little bit rough on this particular trade. Um, it, it does set some things up really well. I, I like I said, I, I like I like uh, what it sets up with Huntress after she leaves. I really like the Cassandra Kane stuff. I just feel like it's all condensed and um, happens a little bit too quickly. And I wish that she was a character that had popped up a little bit earlier. Um, because if she did, I totally missed it. Um, she certainly wasn't in much if she was there because I because I missed it. Um, but. Uh, 
But anyway, um, I do uh, I do really like um, all of the art in this one, and uh, it, it's it's a bit more consistent and um, and not not too sketchy or cartoony. And uh, anyway, um, I think I think that's what I have to say about Volume Three. Uh, I'll bring a Volume Four to you tomorrow. And thanks again for watching the Comic Book Vault. If there's anything you want to send me or Vince to review, you can as always send it to our PO Box, and that's Geek Pollution, PO Box one four one eight three, Lenexa, Kansas six six two eight five. Thanks as always for watching. Again, I'm Captain Logan, and happy reading.